Good morning, church. Yeah. Man, everybody's alive and uh, well this morning. You guys are looking good. Good to see your smiling faces. God bless you for being here this morning. You guys ready to worship? All right, well, we're going to get started right away.
Almighty God, we lift you higher, cause you are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious, you are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher, cause you are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious.
stop it sound well, May I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Oh, 
Spirit is here today. Let us pay attention to what he's doing in this place. The Father wants you to know that he loves each and every one of you. 
and that we can say we know who God is or we know Jesus. But the word says, does the Father know you? There were those who came and said to him, but Father, we cast out demons in your name. And he said, I knew you not. That is a somber thing to hear. But he has the, the solution for that today. You know, the Bible says the enemies know who God is and they tremble. Do we as his beloved creatures, are, we're made in the image and likeness of God. Do we live in such a way that we live laid down, ser- sacrificing ourselves back in, in love and respect and, and goodness to our God? We don't have to leave today or the people online don't have to get up from their seats today and not know how to make sure that God knows who they are. Our Jesus, who came down from heaven, who died a brutal, brutal death, went down and took the keys back from the enemy of our souls. And he made a show of him openly. And then he ascended to the Father's right hand. And if we declare with our mouth that Jesus died and rose again, we can be saved. We can know that the Father knows our name, that he knows us. So don't take a moment today and brush off the invitation from God the Father to have him know your name. Live a life of service and sacrifice to the one who gave his all for you. And Father, I thank you. I thank you because this is because of your great love for us that you gave your most precious precious Jesus for us. And Father God, I thank you that you also sealed us as a down payment of what is to come. When we go on to glory, you gave us the Holy Spirit. And by the Holy Spirit's power, we can walk in a way that glorifies you each and every breath we take. So, Father God, may we, as your people, glorify you today. And, Father, anoint Pastor Mike's mouth that only your words would come forth. And give him what to say from your heart for his children, for your children today, because we need to hear what you want from us. In Jesus' name, amen. And be seated. I, I'm not the service host, but I, I, I felt like I needed to say something in this moment here. Um, a lot of you guys have been feeling that God is in the midst. I mean, God's been doing amazing things in our midst for a long time, but a lot of you, I think, feel that, that he's doing something new right now, that something is breaking forth, that something is, is moving forth. And, and a good part of that is, has been with, in worship, as, when, as we worship, and we're going to excite about that, and we're going to do some things in the fall that fan those flames. But, but one thing I think that needs to happen if we're really going to see a great breakthrough, a great revival, a great move is, is uh, we, we need to take new steps as people of prayer as well. Did you know that, um, you know, we have tons of small groups, but did you know that we have five groups, five life, five life groups that are specifically designated to come and pray, that we gather together? Um, constantly as, as groups to pray. And they're open groups that anybody can be a part of. And I, I really think, you know, we're taking new steps and, and the Spirit of God is doing new things amongst us. And I'm, we're really excited about that. But I really think as a body, we need to move forward in prayer and praying with one another. And, and so, um, 
if, you're, if that's something that you're interested in, those, those groups, and, and I think they're going to keep coming together, but coming together with people to pray um, even once or on a continual basis for God to move, for revival to happen, for you see His Spirit poured out, just right on your keeping in touch. We'll get, we'll get in touch with you about the different options that we have for that and, and maybe even add some new ones. Because that's something I, I, we really feel like that has to be another, as God's moving, and, you, and a lot, like I said, a lot of you have sensed that, that God is doing something new. As he's moving us in these directions, I think prayer has to, taking next steps in prayer has to be a part of that. And so keeping in touch for him. Um, all right. I wasn't the service host. I just jumped in, but here we go. So when you have a job and you're standing there and the senior pastor comes up and goes, can I talk? Is that really a question I have to say? I, I, I can't answer that, right? It's just he's, he's talking now. So that's awesome, right? <laughs> I, um, but <laughs> if I would have said no, it would have been the same result. So I'd have said yes, and now it, I could act like I made the decision. Married guys out there, right? <laughs> anyway, so keeping in touch form, Bill mentioned that just a moment ago. If it's your first time here, please fill that out. Um, and then on your way out, there's a welcome desk. We would just love to say hello to you, and we have some gifts, and just talk with you a little bit. If it's not your first time here, also fill that out. And there's baskets on the way out. You can put those in. Also, on the way out, um, if you don't give online and giving is part of your worship, we have those um, bins on the side there for you. Uh, we have an, an interesting event coming up. It's a lot of fun. I've never attended it. I'm not invited, so that makes it good. But Paul is going to come out here and talk to you about that. And uh, I think she's coming out now. Here she comes. Everyone say hello, Paula. <laughs> um, yes. Wow. Wow. Um, it's bright up here. Um, I'm going to use my cheat sheet this time because first service, I, I forgot the date, the time. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, the women's ministry team would like to invite all the women. Guys, sorry, this is not your event. Um, but women, we would love to have you uh, join us um, for just a, a relaxing, chill time by the fire. Now, granted, let's hope it's not this hot. Um, but Friday, August 26th, from 6.30 to 8.30, and we're going to just share in some great fellowship. We'll have a time of worship, and we will have schmores. Um, if anyone, I mean, we will be providing... Um, everything for the schmores, but I have heard there are some kind of unique recipes. Um, a Reese's peanut butter cup schmore, never heard of it, but um, might be something to try. And if you could bring a lawn chair, if it should seem like it's even um, breezy, cool outside, do bring a jacket or sweater because it does get chilly uh, down at our pavilion. Uh, so there is a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. So hope to see a lot of you ladies there, and it should be a wonderful evening. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not invited for some reasons. But yeah, that's always exciting. I, I've, I have a wife that's been to these things, and they're always fantastic, always great to hear the things that happen during these events and just breakthroughs that can happen. Okay, so Bill did mention there's different groups about prayer. Um, one of those is happening here soon, and we have a video about that.
right. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. Hey, can I get a show of hands? How many men are in the room? All right. How many men like to eat? All right, then. So, hey, come out third Saturday of the month to join us for the men's prayer breakfast at 630. That might be the hardest part, but hey, you know what? If it's an, any consolation, it's probably one of the easiest ways to outreach. If you have a friend, a neighbor, or somebody that doesn't know Christ or wants to know them, invite them out. Have breakfast with them. That's probably one of the easiest ways that you can share the love of Jesus with somebody. So don't forget, that's the third Saturday of the month at 630. So come on out. Um, my name is Mike. I'm the youth pastor here at MCC. I'm glad to see everybody here. and Thank you again. So before we get into this, I'd like to open up in a word of prayer. So please join me. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here. We, Lord, we thank you for just the blessing to be able to be in a room, in the building, being able to share your word. And thank you, Lord, for this time that's here. Thank you for the individuals, the people that are here. But, Lord, we invite you into this room. We invite you in here that you may be able to share through us, but speak through me and open our hearts and open our minds to the words that are being said that we all receive what's here. And I ask that you illuminate something that is said here that may strike a chord or strike a nerve with somebody. And, Lord, we just pray for this day. And we pray for this time. In your son's name, amen. So... We are in the middle of our John series of Greatest Hits, Volume 2, but throughout the whole course of 2022, we've actually been going through the book of John. And yeah, we've started in the very beginning, worked our way through, we've opened up a few spots here and there throughout the year, but now we are in Volume 2, which means that we had to have a Volume 1 which that would took place back at the end of May, beginning of June sometime, but therein lies also the question, well, why volume one, volume two? Well, truth be told, the volume one actually dealt more with things that Jesus did. Um, we saw the blessings, we saw the miracles, we saw the things that he performed to show the people of that time. But volume two deals more with the things that Jesus said, the application of the things that he took, did in volume one. In volume one, we saw the blessings. We saw about five of the seven miracles that, Jesus, or that John talks about in that, chap, in that series. Whereas now, we're just talking about how we can grow in Jesus. In the volume one, we, heard, we saw Jesus' ministry at an all-time high where he was in upwards of possibly 20,000 people. Now, volume two, he's at 12. So obviously, as, if it's any consolation, if it's any indication that as his ministry shrank, things got a little harder. Topics got a little bit more um, rough for people to take. And it's no different now. We're going to be in John chapter 8 today. But before we get into that, I wanted to share something. Something that came to light as I prepared for, for today. And it was, it's crazy because I was thinking back to something that my parents instilled in me. Um, they always taught me how important it was to make a first impression. Um, you know, tuck your shirt in, make sure your shoes are clean, laces are tied, pants are all right, stand up straight, speak clearly, look at somebody in the eyes when you speak to them, make a valid, good first impression. But there also, too, lies that as a product of the 80s, I started to think about different commercials from back in the day, and I remembered a Head & Shoulders commercial where it said that you can, never make, you can never have a second chance to make a first impression. Which, as you grow up and as you get older, you start to realize how true that is, that you really do not have the opportunity to make a first impression a second time. But the crazy thing is, is do you realize that it takes a perfect stranger, somebody that you know nothing about, that knows nothing about you, it only takes them seven seconds to create a first impression of you. Crazy. But the thing is, though, you might be thinking, like, well, how is that even possible? How do they even know about me? It's not about what they know. It's what they see. You see, they base it upon maybe your facial structure. The words that you say, maybe if you have tattoos or piercings, the things of how you dress, the way that you look, even the way you walk, which, mind you, I know this for a fact. I was actually victimized by this. Okay? But, neither the case, it can also be your emotional state. 
and where you stand, whether you look happy or you're sad, you're smiling or maybe you're focused and you just really don't see anything or anyone. You get a misconception of as to who you are. Now, with that aside, these are all things that we are all faced with. Remember, seven seconds. So just to freak you out a little bit, Imagine each and every person that you came in contact with before you got here today, whether you stopped at Starbucks or Dunkin', Wawa Sheets, Turkey Hill, whatever it was that you did this morning. And anybody that you were in the presence of someone for longer than seven seconds, they started to build a first impression of who you were without knowing you. Kind of crazy, huh? Imagine walking in here first time and you come through the lobby. You're in there for longer than seven seconds. But now take for, for example, or for instance, imagine if it's not a matter of visual, which that would be a visual first impression. Now take it upon something that you've heard about somebody. And you're basing it upon something that someone is telling you. You hope that they speak nicely of you because after all, you're thinking to yourself, usually when somebody says, hey, I was talking about you the other day, you're, and your response usually is, I hope it was the good things. Okay, but think of it that way. If when somebody is, talks about you to someone else or you hear something of someone else, you may not know them. You don't understand anything that they're going through. And all of a sudden, that's not the perception of yourself. You start feeling a little like, hey, that's not fair. And that's building something that I have no control over. And you hope that you only pass along, like I said, the good stuff. And because the thing that we're always afraid of is that each one of us usually has a skeleton in the closet. And heaven forbid if that gets out. Because also people tend to like embellish on things that they do talk about and they say. But also, that's a scary thing. Because that normally tends to form a lopsided bias of someone that's never met us and how they see us. But the crazy thing is, even crazier than the seven seconds, is the fact that while people do that to us, we do that to them. That's us, too. We're not shy from that. And you see, the part about hearing something about someone that we may not know about may be something that we're not supposed to know. It might be things that someone was told in confidence that they would not share, but then they share with you, and then they start filling you in on details that you aren't supposed to know, that you aren't supposed to be aware of. And then all of a sudden, you start finding out itty-bitty details that are nitty and gritty, and then you find out that there's sin. And the sad part about it is that when we start to hear about people's sin and without knowing who they are, and not identifying who they are, we then automatically assume that they are that sin. And what happens is all too often is we classify them or we develop this point of view as a person as the sin that they're in. And we can't look at them any other way. We perceive them as being negative, and we focus on them. Now, that sin might be something that they're caught in, that they're trying to get out of. The fact that they shared it with somebody might have been the fact that they were reaching out or crying out for help. But in return, instead, somebody is talking about them. Oop, isn't that gossip? Face facts. If we're talking about somebody or we're sharing details about somebody and that person's not in company, that's gossip. Or it can be. Good or bad. But the fact is that when we see that person in that sin... And when we finally do meet them, we might avoid them. We might try and keep a distance from them. But also what happens is we start to judge them based upon that sin that they're caught in. And like I said, maybe it was a cry for help. And maybe it happened in the years past. And that's not them anymore. But yet they still wear that. Because people look at them like that. And what happens is when people look at them like that, they bear that judgment on them. And then what happens is then they start quoting scripture against them. Or they start building a theology against them. And then that theology becomes the ideology, or your ideology becomes your theology against that person. But see, Scripture warns us of that. Scripture warns us in Matthew 7. 
it tells us in verses 1 and 2, it says, Do not judge so that you won't be judged. For you will be judged by the same standard that you, which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. Bear in mind, we are not supposed to judge others. We are supposed to help them. The fact that that person might be stuck in that sin that they, don't, that they can't get out of, we're supposed to be there reaching them up, not building a wall around them. We're supposed to help them get back on their feet, not push them back down. We should be there to help because that's what Jesus would have done. Now, today's passage, I said it was in John 8. It's a very familiar passage to a lot of people because I feel like it's relatable. Okay, and we're going to read through it, and I want you guys to pay attention and listen to it, and as you hear it, you're going to be like, oh, I know this story. It's about the Pharisees. They bring the woman in in front of Jesus, and, you know, he doesn't condemn her, and everybody's happy. But you see, a lot of people that even do not know what Scripture is and do not read the Bible or do not come to church actually know this story because it is relatable. It is people that are being caught in sin, being called out, and, not con- and Jesus not condemning them. But they've... they've they fail to get to that part. So as we read it, there's four, there's four people or four groups that are in here. I'm going to ask that you try and identify or maybe relate to one of them as we read. So let's start. In verse 1, it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he went to the temple again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They asked us to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. When he had persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older man. Only he was left with the woman in the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus said, go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. Now, see, in some of you guys, if you, depending on the scripture or the the Bibles you use or the translation you use, you might have saw a little note in there. You saw a little bracket in there that said that, you know, John 7, 53 to 8, 11 is not in all manuscripts. Well, the reason why that's in there is not necessarily because it doesn't belong in Scripture, because it does. It's very gospel truth in the Scripture. But what that means is that this new, the New English translation actually referred to this as the best. This is a floating text. And what that means is that it, in certain translations and old manuscripts, it might have showed up in John 7 in two spots, John 21, and even Luke 21. You see, they thought that Luke might have been the writer of it because of certain words and phrases that get used in it that aren't accustomed to the way John speaks throughout his gospel. And, I mean, if you want to have more of an understanding of what that means, think of, for example, when Bill's up here speaking versus when Matt's up here speaking, when I'm here, when Jason's here, we all speak in a different manner. We use different phrases. We use different terms that you know that when I speak, it's not what Bill's saying, and what Bill's saying is not what Matt's saying, and, verse, and so on and so forth. That's very similar to what's being read here, and that's what's being laid out. It doesn't mean that it doesn't belong in here, because it very much does. But what I would like to do is take an opportunity, because like I said in the beginning, this is a passage in Scripture that has a tendency to get glazed over, like, yep, I can relate, but it's, not, it's more than that. There's a whole deeper meaning behind this, and it goes very, very deep, okay? And I'd like to share that with you. So I'm going to go back and jump back to verse 2. And it said, At dawn he went to the temple again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. So when we think of Jesus and his earthly ministry, most of the time what we think of is, oh, the life, death, and resurrection on the cross. Yes, that's fundamental. That's very poignant. That's very purposeful. We need to think of that. But then we also tend to think of, well, the miracles, the blessings that he performs. Very true. That are very important to hear. 
But even more than that, the one thing that Jesus did the most throughout Scripture was teach. That was the biggest thing that he did throughout all of Scripture. He did any, he, that was the one thing he did more than anything else. But we often forget that. But see, that's why when we're going through a series like John Greatest Hits, or I'm sorry, The Greatest Hits Volume 2, where it's, all, it's primarily teaching, obviously things are going to get said that are not going to get agreed with. There's things that are going to say that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. Because, look, after all, it happened to Jesus. It's going to happen now. But also, for a second, if you can, imagine being the people that are in the crowd, that are coming up and sitting at the feet of Jesus, sitting at the author and writer of the scriptures, being able to understand and learn all the insights that are coming out from what he is able to share with them. That is just, I would be in awe being able to sit there because he's going to be able, those people that were in attendance there or in the audience were able to gain so much more insight than we ever will. They had Jesus. So, to move on here. And this is actually where the scripture actually gets flipped upside down. This is where this passage goes south real quick. Because in verse 3, it says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Now, for the sake of argument, imagine the doors busting open and a group of men dragging a woman that is partially clothed, if clothed at all, dragging her in and throwing her in the middle of the room. Because after all, she was caught in the act. But here's the th interesting part, too. Scribes, those were the guys who translated scriptures, or they were the ones who actually knew the scripture. Okay, and the Pharisees, on the other hand, those are the ones who had to enforce the scriptures. But we're about to see how they got it so wrong. Maybe on purpose. Because in verse 4, it says, Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? Now, first off, in verse 4, it says, teacher, and it's in quotation marks. So when have we ever read that the Pharisees actually referred to Jesus as teacher? Not, and I would imagine that if this was in that day, this would be our modern term for air quotes. Because it would be like, teacher, what do you say? Because the fact is, they think they have Jesus. They think they got her. They got him. Because they know that what is about to transpire is a catch-22 for Jesus. They think they have him. Because it says, then they're using, they're pulling out their trump card, for lack of a better term, to say, in the law of Moses, they're using that. Because there's very many variables that go along with that. Because first off, the law of Moses explains to us in Deuteronomy 22.22. 22, it says, if a man is discovered having sexual relations with another woman, both the man and the wife are to be, must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. So the first question is, they bring the woman in, where's the guy? Where's he at? Some scholars believe that he was one of the Pharisees. Some other ones actually say that he was set up, or she was set up, that they knew who the guy was. He might have been a high-ranking official, but they left him out because they didn't want to draw that attention. Or, or, they just were trying to trick Jesus. Because, see, what's about to transpire here is that there's three things that go in the way of Jesus or go against him. First off, the law of Moses. They know, the Pharisees know, that for a fact that if Jesus says, do not stone her, do not kill her, he's going against the law of Moses. And what we've learned in Scripture and in the, in, in the past is saying that, what did Jesus say? I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Essentially, if he says, do not stone her and do not kill her, he's going to be called a liar because he's going against what he's supposed to stand for. Second up, if he is the woman's life, why would he, a woman, why would they want to kill her? 
she's imagining that this is the worst day of her life, standing there, basically being judged by everybody that's on, looking on, only to be feeling like this could be the end. And the third thing that's at stake here is the love of Jesus. Because we also know that for a fact that throughout Scripture, we've read that Jesus is the friend of sinners. So here you have a clean-cut case of a woman that has supposedly caught in sin, that if he says to stone her, how friendly is he to her then? And how friendly would he be to anybody else? The Pharisees are probably like, got you. So what does Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. Why wouldn't he? Because Jesus, he's awesome. But it's not a matter of what he did. He did this for a variety of reasons. Think about it. We don't know, or actually this is the first time that we read in Scripture, and the only time that we read in Scripture that Jesus wrote anything. But what did it say? We don't know. It's the only time that he wrote something, but we don't know for a fact what he wrote on that ground. We can only speculate, and we can only take the word that was in there, okay? Because that word that is written or writing on the ground, what that is translated to is the, is the word grafo. And what that is in reference to is that refers to something of Old Testament or refers to the sacred books, now, if you look in Scripture and you find it any other time, like how the English language lumps everything together, like there's like four different translations for the word love, but we have love. This is very similar to that. Because the word writing or written can be translated as either documenting something or referring to something. And in this case, it's a matter of something that is referring to the something. This term is only found in the New Testament, and it refers or points back to something in the Old Testament, and a reference to Old Testament scripture. For example, when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, and Satan's there, well, hey, jump off of here, and your feet will not strike a stone. And re Jesus' response was, as it was written, because he was referring back to Old Testament scripture. That is the same word there. In verse 7, it says, When they persisted in questioning him, he stood up again and said to them, The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone. Jesus knew this, and he knew what he was doing here. Like I said, he, we don't know what he was writing on the ground. Some believe what he was writing on the ground was the sins of the people that brought him in, the Old Testament, Maybe it was just the sins of that day that transpired. Because if you actually want to go back through and reread the scripture and you want to cross-reference them with the Ten Commandments, guarantee you, you're going to find, I found at least six sins that were broken just in this passage. So if these guys are the ones who supposedly know the law and uphold the law, how are they breaking the law? So Jesus knew that by telling them the one without sin may be the one who cast the first stone, he knew that none of them were qualified. He knew for a fact that she was going to get out of this. The crazy thing is Jesus never said not to stone her. But he knew by saying what he said that he would be the only person qualified to actually throw that stone. And then Jesus, then he stooped down again, verse 8. Then he stooped down again and continued to write on the ground. And he continued writing. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center. Now think about this for a second. Jesus is stooped down on the ground. He's writing whatever he's writing there on the ground. He just tells them that whoever is sinless cast the first stone. And these guys came loaded for bear. They knew what they came for. Their intentions were to get at Jesus any means necessary. Whether it was the life of the woman that was there, but no matter what, they wanted him. 
They were blinded by anger. They were blinded by rage to the fact that she was just collateral damage at this point. But at no point did Jesus look up from what he was writing. And as he's writing, and as these men creep away so ever so sneakily, I can only imagine that since they came prepared, that you would hear... as the rocks fell to the ground, as the stones that they were so willing to throw at her or at him that they dropped as they went away. Now, whether he would have known that they were casting him at her or dropping might be the reason why in verse 10 we get the surprise. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Now, mind you, throughout this entire passage, Jesus never looked at the woman, at least not that we know. This is the first time he's actually addressing her, looking at her, telling her, where are they? And what have they done? They've done nothing. And her response to him was, no one, Lord. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go from now on and do not sin anymore. Jesus, as I said, this was the first time that he's laying eyes on her, that he's looking at her, that he's looked up from whatever he was writing to look at her. Maybe it was because he didn't want to see her in the light of what the Pharisees were bringing her out in. Maybe he didn't want to hear and see what they were saying to have a misconception of her. But maybe he did not want to see her in the light that they were trying to paint because he knew that who she was. And maybe just for the sake of argument, maybe the fact that he looked at, he waited, Jesus waited until everyone left to actually talk with her to actually know who she was. Because it's at that point that her commitment of faith to him was expressed when she says, In verse 11, no one, Lord. She proclaimed who he was in that matter of time by calling him Lord. You see, Jesus, we need to have a fresh vision. We need to have that vision that Jesus shared there. All too often, we get caught up in the idea of let's follow Jesus for what he does and, the act the way that, and we need to act the way he acts, which is very much 100% accurately true. But we also need to see people for how Jesus sees people. You see, all too often, we get caught up in seeing you know, and thinking, okay, John 3.16 amazing and most beautiful verse that we can imagine. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But we forget John 3, 17. For the son of man, or for God sent the son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. We forget that because all too often we're ready to put Jesus back in the corner or on the chair and say, Jesus, no, I got this. I can go out here and I will take care of it for you. The way that they're talking about you, the way that they're acting, these people need to be condemned. Don't worry about it. I'll get this for you. We take the rock out of Jesus' hand, but that's not what he wants us to do. He did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world, and he's doing that out of a matter of love. And that's how we need to have that perception. We need to have that view. So in the beginning, I asked you to listen to this passage and hear or look for the four people or four characteristics or four classes of people that were in here. And it, maybe it's like, I didn't, maybe it's not four. or Maybe I didn't see that. Well, let's hear. First one's the easy one, Jesus. Many of us can say that we relate to Jesus, and we do. We aspire. We want to be like Jesus. But none of us are Jesus. We're not that good, sorry. Sorry. We can only say that through his blood on the cross redeemed us, 
but we can only try and keep our eyes on him and want to be him, but we're human. And we're going to fall short, and we're going to stumble, and we're going to look like a fool sometimes. It's just how life goes. But we can only try and have his vision. Second up is the woman. The woman who was the victim of this whole passage, the one that many of us can relate to, because how many times have we been manipulated? How many times have we been the victim of anger, manipulation, Somebody trying to go through us to get at someone else many times probably. I'm sure each and every one of us in some way or manner or shape or form has been that woman. But you don't have to stay there. And you see there's other people that are probably sitting in here that may not believers or may not know who Christ is. And maybe this is the first time you're at church. And maybe you have been hurt at some point in time in your life by somebody in the church. I apologize for that. It's not supposed to be that way. We are called to love and show the love of Christ, not hurt. Third up is the Pharisees. That was an easy one. But you see, the Pharisees went at Jesus, no holds barred. They went after him. And they did not care what was in the way. They saw nothing but anger, hate, and rage. And these guys are the ones who are supposed to be the ones who are upholding the law. And these are the ones who are supposed to be expressing love. And not only that, but they were the ones who were putting it on the back burner and not caring. They put their religion over grace. They put their religion over mercy. They put their religion over love. And that's what their choice was by the way that they conducted what they did. They manipulated the scriptures by what they did to try and prove a point. But only in return, they wound up hurting themselves. In the beginning, I, I share with you part of chapter 7 of Matthew, verses 1 and 2. But I'd like to finish that now, because this is one that I want us to gain a perspective of from the Pharisees' point of view. In chapter 7, it says, Do not judge so that you won't be judged, for you will be judged by the same standard of which you judge others and will me be measured by the same measure you use. And here's the key. Why do you look at the splinter in, the bro in your brother's eye but don't notice the beam of wood in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye and look, there's a beam of wood in my own eye. Hypocrite! First take the beam of wood out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. All too often, we are quick to judge others for the sin or for the pain or for the trouble that they're in, similar to what the Pharisees did here. They called out that woman because the sin that she was caught in, and for now, ever, she's going to be considered as the woman caught in adultery or the adulterous woman. But the fact is that she doesn't have to remain that way because the fact is, if we look at her in a different light, she won't be that way. And that's how we are supposed to look. We cannot call out the shortcomings and the sins of our fellow believers and even those that are not believers because how would that make our Christ look? Lastly, the fourth one, the one that might have been easily to miss because they didn't take a prominent role in this was the crowd. The crowd in the very beginning in verse 2, it said that the crowd came to sit at Jesus and had for him to teach. Think about what they got to see. They saw something I mean, that was unbelievable. They got to see like Rocky Balboa go against Clubber Lang. They saw King Kong and Godzilla right there in front of them. Religion versus faith. Law keepers versus love. And that's what they got to see. They got to see bondage and freedom. But none of them did anything. They just sat there. They watched. Hopefully they learned from what they got to see. And hopefully they took away what was in front of them. But at the end of the day, throughout everything, the key is to show one another kindness. We need to treat people with kindness, point blank easy as that. We cannot get away from that. Because the minute that you start showing anger, treachery, malice against somebody, 
Where does Christ fall in that? You see, when we are saved, when we accept Christ, we get the Holy Spirit and we get that, those gifts that come with that. But come on. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. They're a gift. How else can we display our gift than with those gifts? Recently, I was on a mission trip, as many, as many of you know, and thank you again for the prayers, the support, everything that went into that. But throughout that time when I was on that mission trip, I had my morning devotions. But I was also preparing for this message today during that trip. And it was coincidental, but not coincidental, because I don't believe in coincidence. But there was the same passage of scripture that came up four times when I was on that trip. Now you see, in the mornings we had a speaker, and then in the evenings we would have a speaker. But then throughout that time, I would also have devotions. And obviously everything was centered around service and serving others and loving others. But this passage came up more often than not on that trip. And this is found in Matthew 25. It says, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And then the king will answer, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You see, the fact of the matter is, is that if we look at anybody or anyone as anything less than a child of God, we're doing a disservice to our creator. People are hurting. People are under pressure. Yes, we sin. Yes, we stumble. Yes, we fall short. But that is what we do. Unfortunately, we are not perfect. And if we could be, we would be with him. But the fact of the matter is, is that we got to get past our hurts and our hangups. Yes, hurt people hurt people. And there's no denying that. And it's a fact because that's what we do. But when we hold on to that grudge, when we hold on to that sin, that's only nothing but we're going to hurt more people. And we need to ask God, we need to ask for that fresh vision, that vision of Jesus that only he can give to us because without that, we're just going to continue to walk around here looking at people as people and not child of God. So as we close, I want to Jesus, I, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, and I pray for this moment. I pray that as we are here gathered, then we are speaking about condemnation and judgment and basing our own ideals on how we feel as though people should be and how they feel like they should act. We are also performing that condemnation on ourselves. We are holding ourselves accountable for things that we cannot control. And Lord, I just ask that you come in and you free us Free us of that bondage that we feel, that condemnation that only you can relieve from us. In Romans 8, 1, it says, For there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, and we know that to be a fact. We know that only you can take that burden away from us. Condemnation is above our pay grade. That is not for us. Lord, so I ask that you take this away from us. And I ask, Lord, that if there is anyone in here this day that does not know you and is feeling the weight or the burden or the pressure of that condemnation, that they might know and ask somebody to feel that freedom and ask what it is, how to receive you, how to be grown, and how to perceive ourselves as a child of God. I ask that they may go to our prayer team because we know that prayer is a sign of maturity and not not and prayer is maturity and not disgrace and Lord we just thank you
We thank you that we have that heavenly window that we may be able to speak to you so freely. And Lord, I pray for this night. I pray for this day, Lord, and I just pray for each person in here that they may feel the freedom that only you can have. And I pray this in your name. Amen.
Father, we thank you for tonight, today. Lord, we just, we just shout out to you today. And, oh, we just give you all the glory, Lord. We just, we just want to be with you. I just pray today that you look upon us and you give us that strength, that wisdom, that just the power to, to spread your name, Lord. It, it's just so needed out there today. I think we, we just shy away sometimes when your name is brought up. And you don't want us to do that, Lord. You, you just want us to spread this good news about you, Lord. And we, we have it in our hearts, Lord. And we, we know that that's what you want. And we know also that you want us to spread that, Lord. And, and I, I myself, Lord, and, and I know a lot of other people in here just say the same thing. It's just so hard sometimes. So today, that's my prayer is that you just give us that. When your name comes up in conversation, that it, that it just magnifies, that people will always see you through us somehow, some way, Lord, that we can turn their hearts around and, 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 and see, let them see you. Lord, just thank you for Mike's sermon today and um, his teaching. And Lord, just, you know, we, we all leave here, I think, on Sundays with just a little bit better of an understanding of you even though our understanding is but a grain of sand, Lord. Just, that's the other thing, is just help us to always understand. Help us to grow when we come here on Sundays. Help us to be with you and to feel you and to feel your spirit in this room. Lord, I thank you for everybody that's here today. And may God bless you all. Thanks for coming. Have a great week. You're good, good, goodbye. To you are, to you are.